We're going to focus more on the situation of migrants around the world with Andrew Geddes. You're the director of the Migration Policy Center at the European University Institute in Florence. Andrew, thank you for taking the time to speak to us. I want to start asking you about the situation in the U.S. where we just saw in that piece by Wasim Cornet. Does it surprise you to see migrants from countries as far away as India or China trying to get into the United States now? No, not necessarily. I mean, we, we're looking at a kind of a very a kind of part of the broader migration picture into the U.S. and it becomes very focused on the border. Uh, so it is possible for people to move into South America or into Central America and make very kind of dangerous, arduous journeys. So I think what we're seeing is a measure of a desperation of some people. And we see it very focused in these border regions with the plight and the distress that these people experience. What do you think when you hear a former American president like Donald Trump talking about migrants, quote, poisoning the blood of America? Well, it's it's a United States is a country that was founded on immigration. Uh, immigration is central to the history of the United States, but it's also become one of the most contentious issues in American politics over the last 30 years. But Donald Trump in his previous election campaign, uh, his successful one in 2016, and again now is is really trying to play on the immigration issue and to make it a salient concern and to really activate his base. So he's not looking to appeal to the American population generally. What he's trying to do is really activate those people who are likely to be his supporters. And uh, this kind of language is very extreme, but uh, he, uh, I think he knows what he's trying to do in trying to activate his base. Is that a trend that you notice generally around the world, that things are getting more difficult for migrants, that the things are getting tougher in regard to the rhetoric? Well, it's not. I wouldn't say it was a global trend. I would say that it's particularly evident in some often high-income countries. So some of the richest countries in the world also seem to be the ones where we see most political contention around migration issues. Uh, if, if we look generally at the global migration picture, the, the overall level, about 3.5% of the world's population are international migrants. And that number is has remained relatively stable as a percentage. What we're seeing is increased intensity. And, and often it is in higher income destination countries like the United States or also in European countries. Hmm. Where do you see most of the world's migrants coming from, particularly in 2023? Well, the picture is very diverse globally. Uh, I think what if and so it's difficult to say was well, one main country of origin. We have seen in Europe very large uh, flows of displaced people from Ukraine, previously from Syria. In South America, we've seen large flows of people displaced from Venezuela. Uh, in uh, in uh, in Southeast Asia, we've seen people displaced from Myanmar. So there are very specific, I would characterize them as regional flows, people who are displaced in often in regional contexts, moving within those regions, within Europe, within parts of Africa as well, where we see large scale displacement and migration in some parts of Africa. So often the movement is on a, on a, on a regional scale. You mentioned Europe a moment ago, and uh, European Union states have now agreed to the final part of an overhaul for rules on how they're going to handle asylum seekers and irregular migrants. What do you think about these long stalled reforms that the EU is hoping to make into law? Well, I think it's been, it's a, as you say, it's been a long process. Really, since around 2015, EU member states have been trying to reach agreement on. Uh, common rules in relation to asylum and irregular migration. I would say there are two things which are particularly worth drawing attention to, one of which is that a very high level of difficulty EU member states have when it comes to sharing responsibility. That means, for instance, redistributing asylum applicants amongst themselves. There's still quite strong opposition to that. That's long been a sticking point. And agreement on those kind of measures is likely to be extremely difficult. Uh, what there is maybe more interest on uh, in, and perhaps some uh, um, and some indications of agreement, is efforts to outsource or externalise migration policy to countries such as Albania, in the case of Italy. Also, been attempts to uh, uh, agree with Tunisia. So, an increased interest in working with non-EU member states as a way to, uh, I think, some people refer to as kind of offshore the migration issue, take it beyond the board. Andrew, we seem to be having a slight technical problem. I just want to stay with that idea if, if we can figure out the technical bit just for, for one minute. Um, what do you think about that kind of outsourcing of, of migrants? 
Well, the, one of the issues is that essentially what you're doing is moving migrants beyond the controls that we might expect to see in EU member states, the kind of legislative controls, the judicial controls, which are uh, commonplace and can see uh, migrants being able to access protection or appeal decisions, extend their stay in EU member states. So this kind of outshoring is often an attempt to move uh, migrants and refugees beyond those kind of protections. Uh, and so I, I think some governments in Europe have become frustrated what, what, what they might see as lengthy legal processes and ability of people to stay for quite long periods of time on their territory and see this as a way to reduce the prospects of that happening. Andrew, the UN has made today International Migration Day. What do you hope will come out of a day like today? What's the most important thing for people to know? Well, I think the most important thing to realise when we focus on uh, global migration is that we tend to see often images of people in distress. And this is an important part of the picture, the rights and protections of people who are in extremely difficult situations. But the vast majority of people who migrate do so through regular channels for work, to study, to join with their family members. So they're motivated by hope, ambition, aspiration, also love for their families. So I think that we, we need to see the bigger picture here. There's clearly important issues around people who are facing life-threatening circumstances. But for many people, migration is, in a sense, a fairly normal activity. Uh, they do it for work, they do it to study, and they do it to join with their families. And I think we do need to see the kind of the bigger global picture here. OK, Andrew, thanks so much for taking the time to speak to us. So you are the director of Migration Policy Center at the European University in Florence. Thank you. Thank you.